Welcome to Coffee with Curators, a special edition of Quilt Side Chats. Brought to you by American Quilt Study Group. The American Quilt Study Group establishes and promotes the highest standards for interdisciplinary quilt-related studies, providing opportunities for study, research, and the publication of works that advance the knowledge of quilts and related subjects. In partnership with the International Quilt Museum at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, the International Quilt Museum's mission is to build a global collection and audience that celebrate the cultural and artistic significance of quilts. Quilt Side Chats are a series of lively conversations between Carolyn Ducey, International Quilt Museum Curator of Collections, and an American Quilt Study Group member featuring the quilt that she or he would sneak out of the building if it weren't a crime. As Curator of Clothing and Textiles at the Museum of Texas Tech University since 2014, Dr. Marion Ann Montgomery cares for over 375 quilts and 6,000 pieces of feedstock materials among the over 36,000 objects in the collection. She is a quilter and quilt historian, having published papers in professional journals, including uncoverings and blanket statements. She is the author of Cotton and Thrift, The Fabric of American Households, Sumptuous Stitches and Tiny Treasures, Needlework and Needlework Tools in the Museum of Texas Tech University Collection, and Miss America Fashion. Dr. Montgomery earned her PhD at New York University, where she studied in the Textile Study Room and the Costume Institute of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She has worked in the museum business for over 30 years, previously serving as the Historic Site Manager for Graham Park for the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission, Curator of Fashion and Textiles at the Tennessee State Museum, Director of Interpretation at the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza, Archivist of the State Fair of Texas, and coordinator of the wildly popular Quilt Mania 1 and Quilt Mania 2 projects in the Dallas area. She previously served on an AQSG board and is on the founding committee of the Lone Star Quilt Study Group. Dr. Carolyn Ducey is curator of collections at the International Quilt Museum, a position she has held since 1998. She oversees acquisition and management of the IQM collection of more than 8,500 quilts. Ducey earned an MA in American Art History from Indiana University in 1998 and her PhD in textiles, clothing, and design with an emphasis in quilt studies at the University of Nebraska in 2010. She is co-editor of American Quilts in the Industrial Age, 1760 to 1870, and co-author of What's in a Name, Inscribed Quilts. And now, let's cozy up to the quilt. Hi everyone and welcome, and Mary and Anne, welcome to Quiltside Chats. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here with you. Thanks for taking some time on a Sunday. Sure. Um, we're doing a little bit of a different program today because we're so pleased to have another curator with us. We both kind of uh, have many similarities in what we do with quilts and our textiles. And I'm really excited to learn more about the Museum of Texas Tech's collection, um, which is not something I'm really familiar with. So I know you have some great slides for us. I think we're going to have a really fun time talking about our experience and, and caring for all these textiles. And thank you for being willing to alter the program a bit. I, I think my director would just have kicked me out the door if I tried to pick somebody else's quilt from another collection. So thanks for altering a bit. The quilt behind me is not normally in my office. It's one of my favorites. It's from the Marsha K. Lackey collection of, um, of quilts made from the Mountain Mist batting wrappers. And uh, it hides an otherwise very messy office. So <laughs> it's not nearly as nice as yours anyway. Um, but, you know, work gets done. So. 
Uh, well, it's beautiful. And I know you're going to tell us a little bit more about that collection. So I'm looking forward to that. So before we get started on your slides, or maybe you're going to cover this in your slides, but can you give us kind of the basic rundown of your collection? It's an enormous collection. It is. It's over. It's about 36,000 objects of clothing and textiles and some toys. And it's the largest collection of this material at a university in the country. Now, you have 85 uh, hundred quilts, which I covet, of course, but um, I'm glad you're taking care of them because I also enjoy the fashion and I have a great fashion collection that I need to, that I care for. And uh, I will say that my time with AQSG uh, has been so important and so special. And those are the, actually that connection is re the reason I selected some of the quilts to show today. But um, this job is both clothing and textiles. And um, so in my interview, they even said to me, now, we know you know about quilts, but you know there are clothing items in this collection. And of course, my dissertation was on the Miss America fashion, so that worked out just fine. Uh, we do have, and I, we have some slides at the end to show some of the other collections um, that are here at the museum. Oh, great. Well, um, shall we start the slides then? And, Let's start and... the slides, yes. All right. Well, um, we have Lisa behind the scenes, and Lisa's running slides and, and, and taking care of all the all that difficult stuff for us. So um, right. we're happy. Right. And that was my that had my email address on it, and we'll see that again at the end of my slides. So we can go on, Lisa. Probably we're most well-known for the Susan Robb quilt um, that is in our collection. It is one of the very few quilts made showing the Southern point of view. If you can look carefully in the quadrant there, uh, in front of the horse there to the right, there's a, a yellow pelican throwing the spread eagle off its perch, which is sort of the Southern point of view wow. uh, about the Civil War, the pelican representing the South, the spread eagle representing the North. Um, can we see the next slide? Um, the fun part about this quilt is that, um, and I, this is one of my favorite pictures with the cowboy hats and the gimme cats. Um, when it came in, there was a big brouhaha in the family about what to do with it. And um, they decided that if it was going to come, they wanted to be able to see this quilt every time they had a family reunion. So every three years is what was uh, intended. And uh, so we get it out. And that was part of the gift agreement. Um, it is actually one of the best times of the year when I get to spend it with the family. And now you talked to me about some of the quilts that have come into your collection and you have a genealogical research team. So tell us about that, Carolyn. Uh, we, we're so fortunate. We have volunteers who do genealogy on any quilt that comes in with either a name that accompanies it or an inscription on the quilt. And um, I had another presentation this week, so I just counted. They've done over 800 of the quilts in the collection. And it's led by um, Joan Laughlin, who was a professor in the um, textiles, merchandising, and fashion design department. And um, she's just amazing. Um, the knowledge that this group has of how to get information from um, Ancestry.com, Newspapers.com, Find a Grave, um, it's been amazing. And it, it and there have just been some great stories. Um, as you know, sometimes all we do find is we can place people in the right place at the right time. We can't always get that why a quilt was made or why the names were inscribed. But they have been pretty dogged in their pursuit of information and have come up with some amazing stories. That's wonderful. I have a volunteer that does do Ancestry.com for me, but it's not a whole team. And uh, certainly we haven't been able to research that many. But you said you've actually been able to track down heirs or family members that didn't know you had the quilt. In a couple of occasions, um, we also track the, so we track the information back, but we also track it forward to see if they're living family members. So yeah, we've been able to notify people that, you know, your family quilt is here in the collection. We had a little issue with one quilt that came out of Kansas where I had sisters call and they both called me in the same week saying, I want that quilt. Don't give it to my sister. And the other one said, they, and I was able to say, you know what? Quilt's not going anywhere. It's going to be here. You can visit it, but it's not, you know, we'll, we'll take care of it for you. And that kind of diffused that situation because it was a really prized possession um, when these two women's mother made the quilt. It was purchased by Sarah Dillo, who was an AQSG member, and it came to us through her collection. So family uh, dynamics are an interesting part of our job. <laughs> they are. And we, we we didn't prepare to talk about that today, but that could be a whole nother oh my God. discussion of the stories, but maybe best not told in public. Anyway, <laughs> I think you're let's right. Let's go on to the next slide, Lisa, please. Okay, so I um, the idea was that I was going to show you a couple intriguing quilts, and you're going to do that too, uh, rather than picking one that we would take home. And I'll tell you the reason 
I chose both of these today is because they have good stories about how they came in, but also um, really they showcase the AQSG research component that they've been, my experience with this organization has just provided a wonderful group of people to help us. And I'm sure you use them too. Sometimes mm, people will say to you, hey, I know this about the quilt in your collection. So um, the one on the left, obviously a Ruby Short McKinn fruit basket pattern that was in lots of newspapers. And she's very important in West Texas. Uh, and then another one made in uh, Maryland that Debbie Cooney helped me to do some research on. So um, Lisa, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, I do want to just really fast show this one quilt because I'm hoping that someone in AQSG can help me find the family. Uh, it came from a dealer. We had a little tiny bit of money we don't usually buy. But next slide, please. You're going to see that it has a lot of Texas motifs. And someone um, said to me, I think it might have been Sue Reich, said, hey, you know, this is something that might need to belong with you. And you'll see that. Um, there's a lot of folk art on this piece. Next slide. Um, and um, it, it was made, I think, in Pennsylvania for a man named Raymond Dwayne Jordan, who married a woman from Maryland, Angela Christine Lane Jordan. They had uh, a daughter, Stephanie May Jordan, and another daughter, Rebecca Suzanne Jordan, and a third daughter born in March of 20, uh, 2000. Um, and next slide. Um, you can see um, that probably some of these are images from, uh, from coloring books. Um, Raymond was born in Pennsylvania, and it's unclear when they came to Texas, but they were certainly here by 2000. Next slide, please. Um, and there's some evidence that Raymond and Angela are separated. Um, and he became a ne'er-do-well. He's not someone I can find. Um, there's someone with his same name that I found who said, yeah, well, um, We've gotten in all kinds of problems because of him. So, no, we're not going to help you any. Uh, and I think she made one not to know him. But I think it went back to the family the person who made it. And then it came out in uh, the dealer. But the next slide, there's a, a courting slide, a courting block between the two names of Dwayne and Angela. And then there are these bizarre uh, images. Next slide. They just make me laugh. Next slide. <laughs> that's a cactus with a cowboy hat my god yeah, go back. yeah uh huh I, you know there are family stories on this quilt that i haven't been able to decipher and that's one of them the next slide has a yes. you know cowboy who's been sat on by a horse um next slide uh, and then here's the one daughter next slide and here she was sort of little miss texas next slide um the next daughter um, and so, uh, next slide, please. Um, and Little Miss Wise County, this is one they, I think, was born uh, in 2000. Uh, yeah, and so we didn't really, the name hasn't been yet given to her. But then, there are these family bizarre pictures. So the next one, please. Okay, so here's Dad falling off the chair at dinner. Next slide. Someone is being shot in the butt while they're riding a bicycle. There's a story there. And yeah. I, you know, we could probably have a great children's hour where they all sat and made up stories to go with the picture. Next slide is uh, something about someone being chased by bees. Next slide. Shh, dad, we don't want dad to hear us. So apparently the kids are bouncing off the walls. They're supposed to be in bed, but uh, trying to be quiet enough that dad doesn't come in. Um, and then the next slide. And how many families have had... Uh, family trips where dad gets uh, steam coming out of his ears and the kids go running from the car because no telling what they've, what, you know, what they've committed in the back. So if anyone uh, on this or later going forward sees this and has an idea of who the Jordan family is and how I can contact them, I'd love to know that. So, so let's what, get back. What, to what were the names again, Marianne? The names are mm -hmm. Dwayne Jordan and Angela Jordan and daughters, Stephanie May, and uh, Rebecca Suzanne Jordan. And I think they may be in Texas, in the North Texas near Fort Worth. But as we know, if, if it's been a bad marriage situation, sometimes the wife doesn't want to be found. And so that's made it a little difficult at my end. So. But it, it just feels like something that someone sitting in Pennsylvania might have thought was what Texas was all about um, with those barrel racers and, 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 and then lots of Texas cities. Anyway. Such great original designs, too. That's so fun to see. 
yeah, it, it really is. And uh, we got it out just recently again because we we're having the cowgirl exhibit from rhinestones to denim. And so it just seemed to be part of the theme. We showed it recently again. So. Well, let's go on to the next slide. Um, this fruit basket quilt uh, is one of the two that I really want to highlight. It came to us, uh, came to my attention when we did a quilt documentation. Back in 2016, we got out all of our, well, we got out a lot of our quilts, all that would fit in the gallery, and um, did a small catalog on it. And then we did two quilt documentations. And you can see that this came in uh, as number 79 in the quilt documentation. And um, when it came in, I said to the family, we would certainly love to have it at some point when you're ready to get rid of it. And then, of course, on the right is the drawing from the newspaper with the Ruby Short McKim um, copyright down there in the lower right hand corner. Um, and so this a, a sister to this a sister quilt came in of butterflies. And when the family brought that in, I said, you know, I, I remember that fruit basket quilt. And then about a year later, they called and said, are you ready for the other quilt? Of course, the answer was yes. So next slide, please. What I, I, I love the piece, but I also love the fact that it gives me the chance to talk about Ruby Short McKim, an honoree of the Cultures Hall of Fame, um, and, um, and to talk about her role as a woman, as an artist, to her training in New York, and how she parlayed her training and her artistic talent into a female-dominated um, business. I mean, a business that really was based around her and the family uh, move forward with that business. Next slide. So we also show things like her patchwork patterns and with the um, with the McKim Studio copyright and mention that these are still available today. Um, next slide. Um, and then of course for me, um, so many of the pieces that come to me are not from collectors, not from dealers, but from family members. Mm -hmm. And so my goal here is not just to preserve the object, but just to preserve the story of the woman who made the, the quilt. And, um, and that's really very, very important to me. In fact, I tell people that I can't possibly take their object to the collections review board for acceptance until I have pictures of the maker or the wearer. Um, because otherwise it doesn't come in. So just right. I'm sure you know that as a curator, once something comes in the door, family's ready to move on and do other things. And so this family, um, as we talked about it, there were three candidates, Helen, Rebecca, and Mary Elizabeth, that could have made the quilt. And more and more, um, things came up that seemed to indicate it would be Rebecca who was the maker. And in fact, one of the family members found a letter from her sister, Ellen, to Rebecca saying, I just finished my third quilt recently and wish you were here to help me with some more. So that sort of pushed us toward the Rebecca Elizabeth Skeen Sawyer as the maker. Um, they also knew that Rebecca was quite a quilter and that she had donated a quilt to the Terry County Heritage Museum. And so that's why we pursued it and think that it was probably made by her. Next slide, please. And we're very fortunate to have this picture of Rebecca Skeen. Can we, um, Lisa, your finger was a bit fat. Thank you. Um, and so we attribute this to Rebecca and um, the research was a lot of fun uh, for us to do it. We were able to even to identify the newspaper that this uh, pattern may have come from. It may have come from um, the Cherry County Herald, which is now the Brownfield News. We haven't done that next level of research to find out, I mean, the next level would be going to the newspapers.com and seeing if it appeared in that newspaper. Um, Rebecca married Monroe Sawyer, who was a very important person as far as West Texas settling the area and developing Brownfield, um, which is a town about 30 minutes, 45 minutes from Lubbock, depending on how you drive. So um, the other, the next slide, please. Um, the other thing that um, I was able to do when I showcased this at a public program was to talk about the wide variety of fruits on this. Like there are Queen Anne cherries um, represented. Uh, the newspaper account listed all of the different fruits, and that was a name that I'm not familiar with. I don't know okay. if you have that variety. Yeah, it's, there are many sort of older varieties that I don't think we see anymore. So there's another level of research to go to wow. someone who is a real food person that can study when when those fruits went out of fashion or how they morphed into what we have today. Um, Rebecca did not arrange her blocks the same way. And you can see here, if you look just at that top row, that the fruits are different. Um, but I don't think it alters the, the beauty of it and the joy of it. Mm -hmm. 
We do have a number of Ruby Short McKim pieces in West Texas. Her patterns ran out here. We know they did. We saw many in a quilt documentation I did in 2010 or so in Abilene. And so it's fun to see her pieces come up. And just, I like it because it was one of those stories that, you know, we had someone at AQSG do a paper and we've had the people at the Quilters Hall of Fame do a wonderful article on her. So it was fun to show her, her things. Mary and Ann, I'm, I'm curious, um, how widespread have the quilt documentation projects been in Texas? Because you've done them in kind of specific areas rather than the whole state um, at one time. Is that correct? Well, there are actually, um, there are really two major ones that have been done. There's one done by Carrie and Nancy Puentes O'Brien that resulted in that first Texas quilts book that has the earliest quilts in it that they then did two other editions of. Um, and then there was another one that was done... Um, and and I have never been able to track down where those people ended up or where those things went. Um, they did do some quilt documentation out here in West Texas. Sharon Newman was here and was very prominent. Um, sh a lot of Sharon's quilts went to the Rocky Mountain Quilt Museum before I got here. She died before I got, arrived here, but she was prominent in West Texas. Um, and they did some things here, which is how we found uh, some of the good pieces that we have, a very sh tiny one. But then we thought we would do a quilt documentation just as part of the exhibit to sort of give people an opportunity to, to bring their quilts. And still out here, I've done bed turnings, although people don't know what bed turning means. So you have to sort of translate it. Um, and people have brought their quilts and they really enjoy, as you know, hearing what we can tell them about the pattern or the colors, the dates, um, and those sorts of but mm -hmm. there hasn't been the wonderful sort of documentation that Mary Kay and Betts did in, in Tennessee and, and so many of the other states did, that Firm did in West Virginia. And, I, and I'm not going to say any more because I'll miss names and people will be offended. So I don't want to get in trouble. Right. Yeah. Well, you we, know, there's a lot of room there for more research. There is. There is. And, you know, you sit at a university, as do I. And um, I will say that being a member of AQSG and going to our seminars and listening to the research that's done, I feel so validated because sometimes, I don't know if you run into the scientists as much as I do, but you know, if, well, if you're not in a lab doing research, you're just not anything. Um, whereas I, I, just because someone's wearing something or sleeping under it, doesn't mean it's not ripe for research. Um, and I think particularly for women's studies, mm -hmm. um, I'm just so thrilled that we're able to, to flesh out these stories of women. There's a lot of amazing history that just hasn't been done in any other way, and the, the quilts really prompt that. And and yeah, I think we're I think we're turning the tide, but it's slow. You know, the humanities just don't have the same kind of um, maybe respect is is the right word, but that the hard sciences, um, you know, that that's what brings in the grant money. And so yeah, we're we're a little bit on the smaller side, but um, I think that we've been able to really prove to people how important the quilts are in telling the story of people who are not perhaps written about in the 18th and 19th century, 20th century. So it's, it's been a, pro, a, a steady progress. Over and time. that goes back to Sally Garut and the founders of AQSG and how yeah. those early women were so adamant about, we will have good scholarship. And of course, Ginny Gunn, Ricky Clark and so many of those that have pushed us to make sure that we have it well footnoted and that it's a proper journal piece, even to our editors today, which we're very fortunate to have. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the AQSG Uncoverings is always the place where we start our scholars because you can count on that peer-reviewed research and all of the footnotes. And it, it's always just a uh, it's reliable, solid information. And, you know, when I started 25 years ago, we were still looking at like McKim's book that was, was very important, but was based on a lot of myths of quilt making. And AQSG really started producing research that was, you know, was well-grounded that we, and, and I think that the, our knowledge of quilts has changed so much over the last 25 years because of that. So now that we've done the AQSG commercial, <laughs> I, and I, I, this is really not a commercial. I really strongly feel that way. And I wouldn't be doing half of the work I'm able to do if it wasn't for what AQSG has, has, has helped me do. So let's move on to the next slide, Lisa.
Um, this quilt um, came into us right before, like literally screeched in the door before we were closing down for Memorial Day weekend. And uh, it was owned by a family member in uh, New Mexico. And uh, when they came in, they brought in several quilts from Canada. And they said that all of these quilts were from Canada. They've been made there and that's all they knew. They thought they were made by Mrs. Galt. Um, and they were, in general, all the quilts were heavy. Um, they were utilitarian. They had been used. They just, most of them were not appropriate. All of them were not appropriate for the collection except this one. And you can see there's a little damage on it, but um, but still, it's a beautiful quilt. It's, it's beautifully made. Um, my first impression was it was an 1880s quilt uh, from the colors, from the patterns. Um, and in looking through Brackman, the best we can do is call this a flying geese variation. Um, and uh, Lisa, can we go on to the next slide? Um, so the family said that it was made by Mrs. Galt, and uh, and that's really all they knew, and they left, and they said, oh, yes, we know a whole bunch about Mrs. Galt. We'll tell you all about her. Um, getting information has been a challenge, but they did identify that it was May Virginia Postman Galt, born in 1887, who they thought had made this quilt. Well, obviously, you don't make a quilt like this um, when you're a child. Um, and so knowing that my impression is that often quilts come down through the female side of the family, I started looking at her parents and her mother in particular. Um, and I found that her parents were married in 1882 in Virginia, in, in Maryland, I'm sorry, in Maryland. And so the thought then, so now I start moving down the research going, well, maybe mother made it in preparation for marriage, or is that just my 20th century, 21st century mind thinking that? Um, or it was made as a gift for them. So you can see Mary Catherine Rice Prosman's dates, 1854 to 1931. And um, certainly she died, as did her husband, before any of the current generation of people who were giving this quote were alive. Next slide, please. So um, I learned through Find a Grave, as you mentioned, a wonderful resource, uh, my favorite one because it's free, um, that she was born in Wolfsburg in Frederick County, Maryland. You said you have some family there now. I do. Um, and uh, she married Benjamin, who was born in Washington County. The family in Canada really didn't know, the, fam the donor really didn't know anything about Mary Catherine or um, Benjamin. Next slide, please. And so here you can see Frederick County and Montgomery County are very close to each other. They border each other. And you can also see from this map that they're not very far from Baltimore itself. Um, and so I started, I went to the shop, as you asked about quilt documentations, I went to the Maryland Quilt Documentation book and started down the road uh, reading through the things that they had there. Next slide, please. And what was really wonderful was that they had done quite an inventory of people and who had the quilts, who had inherited quilts. And basically the bottom line is that the quilts came primarily through the females in the family. So that sort of substantiated what I thought was probably the case, but they had done the hard research. And so it seemed logical that even though they thought it was made by Mrs. Galt, it could have come through her parents. Next slide, please. And then next I turned to Debbie Cooney, who, as you know, is a wonderful representative uh, at AQSG from Maryland. There are many others that are also equally knowledgeable, but Debbie was the one that came to mind. And she was marvelous because, she, you know, she's seen so many Maryland quilts. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, this is what I know about quilts from this area, that they're thinly batted, they're finely pieced. They're finely quilted, and they also tend to have a swag in the borders, the ones from Frederick County, where Mary Catherine was born. And that fit everything about this quilt. It is precisely pieced. It is thin. The batting is thin. It is finely quilted. Um, and so it really documented, because, because Debbie's handled so many, she knew um, what I should be looking for, and um, it just ticked all the boxes. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, and so then I started thinking about, well, am I wrong to think that she made this in preparation for her wedding? Again, going back to the Maryland quilt study, there's a whole bunch of information in there about how women in their diaries wrote about where they got their fabric, Baltimore, Washington shops, how they were stitching, that they were preparing um, quilts for their marriage, um, that they also were helping each other with that. Um, and uh, one of the diaries that's quoted there talks about a woman just shortly about the time of, of our of our maker that she had finished stitching her quilts and that she didn't quilt again. She did other things, but not quilts. Next slide, please. 
And so this gave me an opportunity to also then showcase um, sort of how I do the research to the, in the public program that I did recently. Debbie sent me these images. Can you see on the right-hand side in particular the curved, um, what she calls swag quilting there on the stripy quilt mm -hmm. in the white yeah. area? Um, and, and that is also found on our quilt. Um, next slide. Um, these are also from Debbie showing some very finely pieced pieces that came from a county right next to Frederick um, County, Maryland. Uh, uh, very similar uh, setting. Mm -hmm. Finely done. Uh, took great pride in their, in their work. Um, and then the next slide, please. So then I went back and did a real sort of a deep dive into Catherine and Benjamin and found out that they became uh, members of the Church of Brethren as adults, married in 1882, and then they moved west and they settled in Illinois in 1904. And so this was part of the family story that the family really didn't know because by 1909, they had moved to Canada where they spent the rest of their lives and where they are buried. And they, they did have two sons and a daughter. And so of course, quilts came down through the daughter. Although in my experience, I found that that's not always the case. We have a, a piece from the 18th century in Spartanburg, South Carolina that came through the male line, but Usually, as you know, so many things come through the female line. Um, and um, both um, ben, Mary Catherine and Benjamin are buried in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, and then one more slide um, that relates to this, and that is uh, a quilt made um, by a brethren quilter in Maryland that, that Debbie shared with me. So when I pulled this quilt to do a real um, deep dive in to pe present it at our public program, we call Come and See. Come and See is... Um, where I showcase the newest things, but also things that intrigue me. And the students that work in my division also play Stump Dr. Montgomery. They love to play Stump Dr. Montgomery, where they go shopping in the collection, find things that they think we should show based upon a theme they've decided on. And then I get to do the research and they find out about it at the program, which is always a lot of fun. Um, yeah. Sometimes I find great stories and other times that I don't. But um, as I was working on this quilt, next slide, please. It occurred to me that there's that wonderful purple border, and it'd be a great time to look at some of the aniline dyes and, you know, where purple came from, and and see if I could do a little bit of a dive into that. Um, it led me back to this book, Mauve, on um, the and how one man changed, invented a color that changed the world, um, and things that I really just didn't know about purple and aniline dyes. Um, so reading his book, um, sometimes it got off track, but um, it helped me focus a little bit more on how that process was going on in the 19th century. Next slide, please. Um, usually the Virgin Mary is depicted wearing blue, but in this case, uh, in the Byzantine area, she was actually in a royal purple. So purple was always very expensive because of its source, and that's one of the reasons they were looking for a cheaper version of it. Next slide. Um, and Perkin came up with this. He was looking for, uh, he was looking for a cheap method of uh, making um, quinine to solve the whole malaria problem, but he came up with this sludge in the bottom of his beaker when he was working with coal, coal tar. I never knew what color exactly he came up with, but look at this great documentation. He's even signed it, or well, at least I think he did. I don't know. I could, didn't compare it with anything, but that, um, so it gave me an opportunity to talk about purple and how it became very important with Queen uh, Victoria wearing it. And there was even such a thing as mauve measles that they called it because every woman wanted to wear that color. Um, <laughs> um, and so it just, you know, it's fun to add those little tidbits to, when I show objects that come and see, I'm really teaching history through the objects. And so this wonderful, beautiful quilt gave me a chance to talk about the history of the color purple. Um, and then the next slide, please. Um, oh, we skipped one. There should be one in between there. There's not. Well, gosh, Marianne, that um, research is just so amazing. And I think what's, um, you know, when we hear um, family information, we've learned through the years that you have to be really careful with family information because oftentimes it's like the worst source because people hear stories, they don't write things down, they're repeating things, and that information gets very um, confused. So it's great when you can go back and you can say to the family who didn't even know that perhaps this quilt was made in Maryland rather than in Canada because they just hadn't gone back and done that research. So right. that's really amazing that you were able to put so much and look at so many great different sources to kind of really help flesh out that the quilt probably may have been carried to Canada rather than made there. 
Yes, and and wow, what an interesting, wouldn't it be interesting to do sort of a diagram of the, of the country and where things went and how they got to certain places. And and also some of our, our Spartanburg quilt, uh, South Carolina quilt came to Texas in a covered wagon along with a 19th century wedding dress that we're going to hopefully show in April and a, a, a piece of that woman's trousseau. And so the stories are just amazing. That particular quote, which I'm sorry I didn't show you today, but um, because it's hard to show white on white, um, it survived both the northern invasion of that plantation and the southern renegade invasion, and then survived a ride in a covered wagon to West Texas. So. Isn't that amazing to think that these tender textiles survive all of that? But I think it's such a great indication of how valuable they were to women. They treasured those textiles and they meant that was their connection to that family that they were leaving behind. So they were really important. Yeah, I think you're right about that. And yeah, it's also interesting watching image. Uh, Lisa, can we find a picture of a quilt somewhere to show instead of this Perkins moth? Um, yeah, okay. It's interesting when quilts come into the collection. This is an image, this is one of my favorite images, I'm sorry it's not better focused, of uh, coming up one day to go to lunch and um, that charming little girl sitting and studying um, the quilt that's behind me. Um, it's interesting watching these pieces come into the collection because, you know, they'll come in, I don't know how they come to you, but mine are often family pieces. So they come in a rolling suitcase or in somebody's arms and it's something that they've slept under or they might've hung it in, uh, their, uh, in their dining room or in a loft over a balcony. And suddenly it is transformed from a family piece to a museum object, in my case, owned by the people of the state of Texas that we will only ever touch with gloves or if we're stitching with very clean hands. And it's sort of a magical moment when things go from one to the other. But also sometimes tears. Have you ever had that happen? We have. And we've oftentimes had people comment how, you know, before it arrived at the museum, they're like, well, if you wouldn't believe the things we did with it before, <laughs> now you're saying it can't be touched anymore. But I think um, what we see most is that people, because we do have a lot of family quilts come in, they come in all kinds of different ways. Um, but they are just grateful that we can care for the pieces. And they do come back and visit often. They feel very closely tied to the quilt, mm -hmm. but it's just become such a responsibility. And they, they're very aware that the, the, maybe the next generation is not going to care for it the same way. So they just really feel, I think, um, grateful and they can trust that it's gonna be cared for and that hopefully it's going to be around for many more generations. Um, and that, that, like I said, I think once they realize their families can come visit, come see their family quilt, I think they feel better about knowing that it's here and that um, it's still available to them. Yeah, let's just talk about that for a second. As you said, we have the same policy. If you give us a couple days notice, that you can make an appointment, then we can pull the quilt for you and you can certainly see it. Mm -hmm. um, in my case, I, I'm an individual, I don't have staff, I have students, and so I have to schedule when I can show you something based on when they can help me get it out because it's not always easy to get one a piece. Exactly. Out. And but we have to, yeah, we have to make arrangements, we have to figure out who's around, it takes two people to handle quilts. So, um, but it is a really lovely moment when somebody comes in and especially because oftentimes, like you said, it's a family reunion. People have never seen the quilt before and it's such an emotional moment for them. Sometimes I kind of feel bad that we don't want them to touch the quilt because it's such a, a physical connection to that past of theirs. And they just really um, are so overcome with emotion seeing it. So um, it's a kind of a, a, it's a magical thing and it's a very emotional thing. We have a crazy quilt that has a lot of um, hands and names on it. And one of the women in the area had been bringing every family member that came to town to see that quilt. I um, haven't heard from her in a while, I hope she's okay. But yeah, it's very emotional, so yeah. It is, yeah. I think it may, I think it's a good thing for people to realize that you know, we don't, we have a large collection. We don't show quilts that often. And so we don't want people to feel like we lock it up and they can never see it again. And I think that's been something that really helps people when they're considering a donation. And for us, the come and see program helps to mitigate that a little bit because the Holder quilt just came in in May and I was able to show it in, in October. Um, and, and so I can get some things out, but not everything can come out. I come and see and, and um, it's nice, but 
you're right. Sometimes things come in and they just have to go in boxes until the right exhibit comes up. Exactly. And we're one of the things that we do just to kind of, I mean, it's it's not um, it's not a, a substitute for being able to see the quilt, but we do post our entire collection on our website. So once a quilt's gone through the accessioning process and is photographed, it'll be put online. So that way, the person who's looking for it can search under that maker's name, and the quilt could sh will come up in a Google search. So they can at least see the quilt. They know it's there. I am actually surprised that. Sometimes people will call after many years of giving a quilt and they're like, do you still have my family quilt? Do you know where it is? And I'm like, I think I do actually. Oh, I'm surprised that they don't realize how we keep records so carefully. So of course we know where that quilt is and we can find it and we can locate it immediately. But um, yeah, so let's talk about that a second. So if someone calls me, it's who gave it or what name is attached to it? And I do a search in our database. Our database, our images are not up online, except that everything prior that came in prior to COVID is on the quilt index, as are all of the quilts that we documented in the those two quilt documentation days. But so if someone calls us, and of course you have an accession number. That's we all have accession numbers. That's the fastest way to get to something. But who's going to remember a three-digit number? So um, the person's name or who you think it might have been is the best way um, to find those things. And then we go searching. And usually we find things. And if we don't find it, it's usually we found it a week later just because we didn't count right or we didn't, you know, do something. It was a, an error, a human error, not a story yeah. error. Our, our biggest one is that um, people early on gave things to the, his, um, the Nebraska History Museum, Ooh. and people are confused which museum they have. So oftentimes, if we don't find it, we say, try the History Museum, and that's where it's at, because they do have an amazing collection there as well. They so, yes. but we, you know, I, I just always find it interesting that people, um, especially if they say, do you know where it's at? It's like, well, we keep really <laughs> careful track of those things. So, yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure I know where it is. Yeah, it's probably in that one big room. Yeah. 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 So it's fun to show them, though. It is fun. It's fun to get them out and it's fun to see the colors, and there's so many, and it would be nice to be able to show things all the time. Yes, it would. Now, your your exhibition space is totally controlled by you. I um I have to lobby for real estate. Um, and um, but I have a, a great exhibits guy to work with and we have six curators here in the building, but I'm the only one of clothing and textiles. And it really, it's just the art curator and me that are regularly doing exhibitions. And so um, when those other curatorial departments wake up, it'll be harder. But for right now, I'm able to get a lot of things up depending on how much time it takes us to do it in the, in the division. Yeah, I think that's our probably um, the thing our guests ask most often is we want to see more quilts, more quilts. And honestly, we've put quilts up on every single wall in the museum. We have an education collection that's just for that purpose. So we really tried to respond to people wanting to see more quilts, but they're not going to come and see even a tenth of the collection when they're here. And like you said, making sure families that give quilts understand that it, it's a curator's choice and it has to fit with the theme of an exhibition. We can't really guarantee when the quilt will next be out. But we also do notify families when the quilt's coming up and when they're going to be able to see it. And they do always make a, a journey out to see the quilt when it's in, in an exhibition. So curator's choice. And you have some pictures to show us of your quilts. I, you and know, I moved those to the end of our slides because I was curious to see your. So why don't we just keep going through and tell us a little bit more about your collection. And if we have time, I do have a couple that were, again, AQSG researched quilts to, that we can talk about. But... I was so intrigued, especially with this amazing and massive bead set collection. Oh my gosh. Man. Well, we have this because of Pat Nichols. And Pat Nichols is an AQSG, uh, I think probably a founding member. She's certainly was a member before I came to the, to this. And, and those of us that were in San Diego got to see her wonderful collection at the Manet. And the Quilters Guild of Dallas, uh, when I was on their endowment committee, did help to fund um, uh, the digitization of all of her quilts in the Manet collection. And when, literally like two weeks after I arrived in my off in the building, not even in my office um, here in Lubbock, she called me and said, you know, I have this big feet set collection that I'd like to, to see go somewhere, but I can't give it. I want, I want some money for it. And, and I think you'd be the perfect place for it. And so again, uh, an effort to raise some money and she gave, uh, 
it, it was she gave most of the collection but there was some money also given and her collection is just fabulous because she collected as you can see all of these pieces that are in this picture feedbacks from her collection some still with their labels on and then swatches um thousands of swatches and quilts and also garments next slide please here you can see some of the garments um, and then also some of the um, quilts that she gave us. Uh, and then we have gotten other feet sack, uh quilts and also uh, Lena DeMarco has given us several garments and other objects that were feet sack made. So that's a big research collection for us. And so just to kind of hang out with the, uh, with the scientists, we call it a research collection. There's so much that could be done with this collection as far as um, patterns and reproduction of patterns. Um, and of course, as you know, you can only be sure that a fabric is feed sack if it has the holes in it from, right. the, from the string. Um, and during the swap, uh, I don't know if you remember, if you were involved in this, Carolyn, but I can remember at the turn of the century, 1999 to 2000, women were making quilts with, you know, like 2000 swatches in them. And so Pat got involved in those swaps and said, if you have any with holes in them, I'd like those best. And so m many of the swatches have that. Um, without her kindness and working with us, we could never have done this. And then the ex exhibition uh, resulted in the book that is available on Amazon, Cotton and Thrift, Feed Sacks and the Fabric of American Households. And then next slide, we also, um, uh, of course we have an embroidery collection. And the embroiderers here in West Texas are very serious. I learned to embroider as a kid, but these women are doing stitches I never heard of um, and oh. probably could never do without the extra glasses. Um, but Pat Grapp, who was a friend of the first, the founding curator of this collection, uh, of the museum's collection, went to Edinburgh with the ICOM International Committee of Museums when Betty, Betty Mills went from the, the curator here at the museum and she began her collection. And Pat has an eye. She also has studied needlework at the Royal School uh, of Needlework in, in England and also at Lesage of Paris and um, built this collection of over 750 pieces. Now they're needlework tools and also um, needlework itself. And we did an exhibition of that which resulted in a catalog that is available on Amazon. Next slide. Um, here's some more pictures from that. Nodding shuttles are something you might not have ever heard of, Carolyn. Um, and I'm not sure if you lived in the East or just in the Midwest. You're a Midwest in the person. Midwest. Yeah. I'm familiar with shuttles. I don't know that I know if, if there's a difference between nodding and other shuttles. There is. Nodding shuttles went out of favor at about the time of the French Revolution. And so they know about them at Colonial Williamsburg and they actually do things with them. But they're much larger. They're more like four inches uh, as opposed to a tatting shuttle, which is much smaller. And nodding shuttles have an opening that's at least a half inch large, and they really used string, and they would knot these threads. Um, they could do it in very low light levels with their friends, which is why they're so exquisite. You can see that one is uh, is enameled and has uh, rose-cut diamonds on it, probably from one of the Louis courts um, in France. Um, and um, it was done by the society women, and you would use it to give dimension to your embroideries. And you could put it on clothing, you could put it on uh, your embroidered uh, bed hangings and other places like that where you wanted some depth. But it was mainly uh, an upper class kind of thing. And we have an incredible collection of those pieces. Um, next slide. They're beautiful. Oh, there's the picture I was looking for, where um, you can see that our mauve, uh, our purple there, is really on the same color that was on one of the... Um, the stamps about the time that our quilt was made. So it's kind of an interesting, that's when that color was fashionable. I'm not sure what's next, Lisa, but let's see it, please. And then as I mentioned, the, the Mountain Mist collection, um, the, uh, the Zinnia quilt, which is on the right, was the other option for this morning uh, behind me, uh, Megan preferred. And you can see Linda Pumphrey came out to speak to us um, when we had that exhibit. And she's such a wonderful person for taking care of all of those Mountain Mist ephemera pieces and the story. We're just, we wouldn't have a lot of Mountain Mist without her. And you have a huge collection because we Linda do. Yeah. Them, right? And, and, and our collection is all, is survived definitely because of Linda's efforts to keep it together. And we've got some of the company materials and um, some ephemera. And we've been lucky to find here and there a few more additional quilts that we didn't have. I think we, we have 200 of the Mountain Mist. So I think we're still short a few of the original patterned, um, the quilts. We have the patterns. 
but we're, they show up now and then. Some were just a lot more difficult, I think, and didn't get made very often. So yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think you're right. But Linda's amazing. Gosh, I, she was such an advocate for that collection. She was that you would not have what you have in your collection if she hadn't kept it together because you got their original company's quilts. Right. Um, which is incredible. And oh, she, Marcia, yeah, she would tell stories about how the owner of the company would say, I need a graduation present. Go get me a quilt out of the collection. And Linda would say, no, but I'll make you one by Monday just yeah. so that you have a quilt to give. But I, I'm not going to pull one out of the collection. So she really did say that. Yes, she really did. And we're fortunate to have Marcia Kalaki's research materials that came in with the 36 quilts. And we've also had a few other mountainous quilts come into us from other donors. So it's it's nice. Um, we have a few duplicates, but not very many. What's the next slide, please? Oh, and um, our current exhibition, I mentioned um, that I also have to do fashion. Our current exhibition is comparing our vintage pieces, which uh, uh, that were women used to wear war to ride horses such as this 1870s uh, side saddle outfit that's actually wow. on this horse it's sitting on actually on a side saddle can't see it but the dress is covering it um, and then some vintage pieces and we we're comparing that with what women are wearing today which has been a great fun uh, dive for me into the whole world of, of horses and dressage and rodeo and barrel racers and this rodeo america um, it's been great fun well, and that's a huge kind of fashion area all of its own, isn't it, today? It is huge, especially when you get into Miss Rodeo America and the designers that are designing for them. And, um, yeah, and and uh, in the lime green outfit that you can see in the image, actually in both images, was worn by Fern Sawyer, an honoree of the uh, Calgary Hall of Fame, but who is also really a woman who competed in rodeo and was at Madison Square Garden in the 40s. Um, that garment was made by Nathan Turk, a Polish immigrant um, and who came to America, settled, uh, set, set up a dry cleaning and alteration store between the homes of the cowboy stars and the studios and got to know them and then did more and more for the cow, cowboys. And in fact, Nathan Turk is in the Country Music Hall of Fame because he also dressed people like Gene Autry and other singers. So yeah, it's wow. been an interesting, totally different from quilts, but a real interest, um, interesting place to go for me. Well, it's fascinating what you can learn from objects. They take you in a place where you just never even it's, it's like a completely different world that you're never aware of. And that's one of the things I just love about doing that research, because you just never know where you're going to end up. You do not know. Who knew when I came? Who knew when I came out here that I deal with that lime green outfit? Her niece is still alive. She said that Fern had one of every color. Um, from Nathan Turk, heavily rhinestone. And when you see her in pictures, you can see her in the arena, it, it sparkles. Um, but she didn't have it in yellow because yellow is considered bad luck in the arena. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> yeah. is, is there another slide or are we done with my slides? Oh, yes, of course. My dissertation was on the Miss America pageant. And several years ago, we were able to borrow got our objects from Kent State. Uh, the Oklahoma History Center, um, the Mississippi Archives, and other and Tennessee State Museum, um, and showcase garments worn by Miss America to go with uh, uh, a book that I wrote that showcases the swimsuits and evening gowns they competed in over the hundred first hundred years of the pageant, uh, oh, which is another deep dive into all sorts of stories. Um, what was your that. favorite garment that you learned about? Mm, one of my favorite garments. Is, one of my favorite garments is actually that blue green one that you see in the picture on the right. Um, and it, uh, I first started studying the pageant in 1967 when a family member uh, came back with the Miss America pageant book. Um, she had been to Atlantic City and Jane J. Rowe is wearing that dress in a Pepsi ad in that book. And to actually see the dress and put it on a mannequin after studying it since I was in junior high is just, you know, kind of, uh, it was kind uh. of interesting. Yeah, very that's different. amazing, Mary Ann. Yeah. That is so cool. And actually, many of the pictures, many of the garments here on the left in the left picture were worn by also worn by Jane J. Rowe, and she had given them to the Oklahoma History Center. And um, they sent me sort of their description of what it was: pink dress, gold dress, blah blah blah. And I'm like, no, oh, no, 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 no. This pink lace dress is the one she's in in the band lawn ad in the back of the of the of the program book. Um, <laughs> So I went through and helped them document more of what they had. And she also helped me by talking about all of the objects. And I shared that with them and gave them more 
research information about that. So anyway. Well, it's just such a great example that, you know, even though these pieces were collected and preserved, they just, there wasn't a lot of information about them. And I think that's so often the case with quilts is that you get some tantalizing little tidbits, but it's not until you delve into them that you can really kind of put them in their place or in their context. Um, we're focusing right now, really, um, the collection has grown a lot. And now we're really focusing on quilts with provenance because we're realizing that those are the benchmarks that we need. Those are the, the quilts that have, you know, confirmed dates. So even with a date on a quilt, you have to be critical and, and really look and, and say, does this date work within, like you said, like your 1880s quilt. There were so many reasons that you put it in that time period rather than a different one because so everything has to come together but it is just it's fun to realize that and it's fun to be able to to put a quilt or an object in the place and and get that wonderful information so that you know in the future people will really understand what it is and wouldn't it be fun to you know visit with a curator who's sitting in your chair 100 years from now because she's going, she or he is going to know so much more than you or I know about our collections. Absolutely. Um, yeah, of the new research that's going to come out. Um, it's a lot of pressure, isn't it? You feel like I've got to get this stuff documented and I've got to make sure we do a good job because in a hundred years, I don't want that curator saying, why didn't they document this? Or why didn't they write down the names? Um, that's actually um, one of the things that I'm planning on doing is a research project just about the museum and the, the artists in the collection who can talk about their work in their own words, yeah. because that's the information we wish we had so often. Yeah. So I'm trying to fill in some of those gaps so that I feel like I've left the collection and the future knowledge in a and good you place. Came in, you came into the collection sort of really at the beginning, whereas I have followed some people. and. Um, my mantra with the students that come through here that are graduate students of the Museum Studies program is they did the best they could at the time. Right. And uh, even now, you know, yesterday I listened to Newbie Richardson talk about rolling or not rolling quilts. And, you know, you just sort of have to say that the curator at the time did the best they could with what they had at the time. And so we'll know different storage methods, maybe, or we'll know different care methods, or they'll be able to research things that you and I could never get our hands on. Um, well, and that's exactly one of the reasons why we're so careful with any work we do with the collection, because when we're doing conservation work, we actually work with Patsy Orlovsky, who, you know, she and her husband were such early individuals as far as quilt history, because really anything that's done on the quilt should be able to be undone so that in the future, a better way of conserving them can be used. So we try to be really conservative with our approach to how we, to any work we do, because we do stabilize quilts. Um, if Patsy's team thinks we can get a quilt, quilt washed, we will wash it, but we don't do any of that in-house. We, we look for her expertise and caring for the quilts. And that's all we can do is do the best that's available to us during our tenure. And that also brings up another subject. And that is, are there funds for that or should the donor do that prior to bringing it to us? And certainly we wouldn't want them to throw it in the bathtub, but there have been dresses that have come in and I literally had to take them home and iron them. And I'm sorry, I just didn't get into the business to be somebody's laundress. And I've had donors, potential donors say, can't you have the kids clean them? I'm like, no, they didn't come to Texas Tech to be do your laundry. Um, um, and so one collection that came in recently, I said, we would really love to have these, but they need to be cleaned. So she sent them to the cleaner um, and one, the cleaners broke one of the buttons and we couldn't take one of them because that was an important part of that garment. And so it's hard to know how to handle and how to care for. And you sort of do the best you can. There are just a lot of elements like that. And, you know, um, like you said, just doing the best you can, doing the best you can with storage. And also, like you said earlier in your program, making sure that when you get a piece, you're exactly right. If you do not get information when you get that quilt, people say, oh, I'll get it to you. I'll get it to you. They rarely do. And so being really conscious of those different, just little things like that, like making sure that the information comes with the quilt, that you get the photos right away. Mm -hmm. It's just something you learn pretty quickly. And I just feel like it's, you know, we, we both obviously recognize this through AQSG. We recognize how important that history is and how important we documenting everything we can is. Or, you know, we use possibly's and probably's, 
Um, I will say um, our director, Pat Cruz, our initial director, was so careful with that. And she would always say, how do you know what you know? And so we we try to always, you know, be very, very clear with what we absolutely know and what we think we know or what might be family information so that we can lead the way for the future research. Right. So the document, so the database says the family thinks blah, blah, blah. Exactly. But Oh my gosh. Thanks, anyway, blah, blah, blah. Man, we are already out of time. I can't believe it. We could talk all day because we've got so many wonderful stories and so many amazing things and so many generous people. I, I've, I've just always been so grateful for all of the families that will donate or even at least give you a really great deal um, in sharing their, their um, amazing information, amazing pieces that they have. It's just been so much fun to have you here today. It's nice to have a chance to talk to you. It's usually emails back and forth, quick, quick information we're sharing. So yes, it's lovely. Well, and honestly, um, our GTF, our genealogical task force, if there are people out there that are stuck on a quilt, they haven't been able, they generally um love to delve into these mysteries. So you can always email and I could give the give the information and see what we come up with. Um, I have to say we have a couple of new collections that have come in with a lot of inscribed quilts, but we were getting to the point where we were kind of caught up. So we always seem to have time. Um, so definitely get in touch. And if you have something that you're stuck with, Joan Laughlin is amazing. So, but you also are mentioning an opportunity for our members to volunteer at their museums in their local area if, if the curator's willing to work with them. We would not be able to exist without our volunteers. That's mm -hmm. for sure. So mm -hmm. um, definitely do think about that. And um, oh, Lisa says, what do you do with donations that just show up? Oh my gosh, I cannot tell you, Lisa, how many boxes we get that have no return address, yeah. that, things that come to us in very interesting ways. And that is something that we try to find a home for. It, we, we look, we try to see if there's some way a quilt can be used. And sometimes, um, sometimes there's not, sometimes they're not in a condition. I think a lot of times people do not want to be the one to get rid of a piece if it's really gone past the point of no return. So they count on us to do that. I don't know about you, Marianne, if you have that. Our, uh, the, the security guards that man our visitors uh, kiosk, uh, first point of contact when you come in the building, they are told they will lose their jobs if they accept something that the curator hasn't said they will, are willing to take. So um, yeah. Um, we try really it, hard to, it, to well, not. It is because when it comes in, then it's like the property of the state of Texas and there are lots of rules we have to follow. Exactly. Julie Silver, thank you for your very kind words. Thank you, Julie. Yeah. Oh, gosh, so everyone, thank you so much. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. And Mary and Ann, thank you so much. This was such a lovely conversation today. Thank you for letting us know so much about your collection and sharing all those beautiful textiles and clothing. And thank wow. you for chatting about how you handle things. It was great having a chance to talk to you, Carolyn. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you.